Hey friends, welcome back to today's episode of Truth Shots. I'm your host, Jeff Lyle, pastor at the church at Winder in Bethlehem, Georgia. And I'm really thankful that you guys have tuned in today. You know, people will ask Christian leaders from time to time, hey, what are the keys to a victorious Christian life? Like usually it comes from new converts or somebody that maybe is new to the Bible and they really are starting to hunger for God's breakthrough in their life. And they, they want to know, Hey, what's the secret? You know, what's the key to the Christian life? And I'm always almost apologetic and saying, you know, it's not like these three things you do for a month and you become an instantaneously victorious believer. Uh, a Christian breakthrough doesn't usually work that way, but that doesn't mean Christian breakthrough can't come. It doesn't mean victory won't come. It doesn't mean that a deeply satisfying Christian life can't come to you. What it does mean is there are some things that have to be in place in your life and my life for any potential breakthrough, victory, uh, deep satisfaction and a life that glorifies God and is pleasing to us. Um, there are some things that I call non-negotiables. I'm going to give you four of them today. That's right. In today's episode of Truth Shots, I want to give you four essential words for victory. That's what we're going to talk about on today's episode. You know, I don't know anybody that doesn't want victory. I, it just doesn't make sense. Of course you want victory. Now, how badly you want it may be a different story, but everybody wants victory. Nobody loves defeat. Nobody with a healthy spirit loves defeat. We all want to win. Um, but I'm going to tell you something that I've learned today. There are four ingredients in my own walk with Jesus that have been um, non-negotiables for the better part, almost three decades. God, by his grace, showed me these things early on, and I embraced them as ideas and concepts of the Christian life. But then I began to work and live them out over years. And I found that as no matter where I am, no matter what season of life I'm in, no matter whether I'm on the mountaintop or in the valley, whether I'm surrounded by a bunch of happy people or a bunch of angry people, none of it matters. These four words to me are always with me. Now, there are plenty of other things that are going to come to you as things that you may need to add on to your faith journey. But I promise you, if you can get these four words down, uh, then you're going to be farther along than the great amount of Christians who are just living the ho-hum average Christian life. So I'm going to give you a bunch of scripture today because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so if you take notes, you can write down these scriptures. My friend Josh is going to put them up on the screen for you. And so I, I, let me just start with the very first word. The very first word that I would consider an essential word for victory for those of us who are Jesus followers is the word trust. Now, you may yawn at that. You may say, well, duh, we're saved by faith, Jeff. Of course, we got to trust. Now, listen, I'm not talking about just getting saved. I'm not talking about just you know going to heaven when you die. That's such a sad thing for so many Christians. They think the whole goal is just, I want to go to heaven when I die. Well, what about life before you die? <laughs> what about honoring God before your death? What about enjoying God now? And the only way that we can really do that is to be growing in this thing called trust. And so let me give you some verses that I think God will use to spark this. Because some of you may be in a, a trust valley right now. You may be in a place where your trust is at an all time low, or maybe it's hitting rock bottom, or maybe it's just kind of, it's kind of taking a dent, but you got to fight for this. You got to continue to trust the Lord and your trust should not be diminishing. The further you walk with Jesus, it should actually be growing. You actually should be trusting the Lord now more than you were a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. Psalm 37, famous verses, verses three, four, and five, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Man, who doesn't have my first Bible? I mean, who doesn't love these verses? My very first Bible. My dad gave it to me in 1975 and inscribed in the front of that Bible is Psalms 37 verses four and five. It's an amazing thing that from a young age, God was trying to get my trust. And so in 1975, one of the first verses I ever remember reading was this. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, Jeff, and he will act on your behalf. 
Now, you either get to believe your Bible or not believe your Bible. So when your Bible says, if you commit your way to the Lord and trust in him and he will act on your behalf, that's either I believe it or I don't. What are some other verses about trust? What else does the Bible say? Because I could give you a hundred of them. We could spend the whole episode of Truth Shots today just talking about trust verses. But I don't have to give you a ton, but I'm going to give you a couple more. Jeremiah 29, 11. Here's another famous verse. Book of Jeremiah, chapter number 29, verse number 11. God is speaking. And he says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Let me read it again. For I know the plans I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know that word welfare, when we think of welfare today, we just think of like the government subsidizing low-income uh, households with a welfare check. But if you think about what the word means, it means uh, provision to help you fare well, to do well. That's what it means. Welfare is faring well. And what God says is, I'm going to give you a different kind of welfare than you've ever thought about from the government. I'm going to give you myself, my promises, and my plans for your life. If you trust me, you're going to fare well. The plans I have for you are not evil. They're not plans of pain and oppression and brokenness and, and, and subjugation. They're not plans for poverty and sickness. Those are not my plans for you. God says the plans I have for you, I know those plans and therefore your good welfare to give you a future and a hope. So again, it's another test. Do you trust that? Do you trust that God is not only good, but good to you? It's a trust thing. And this is one of those things in my life from a very young age. I either am going to trust what other people say or what God says. I'm going to either trust the, the nature and the heart and the character of God or my own jacked up emotions and the way I view things. I'm either going to discipline my mind to believe what God says and who God is, or I'm going to give my mind to all of the negative uh, uh, streams of communication that are coming at me. Trusting God is a discipline. It's not a feeling. Because if you wait for the feeling, you might not ever trust God. But if you start trusting God, guess what? Your feelings will come into alignment. It's a decision of your will. Oh, it looks tough out there. Well, trust God. Well, I'm trying to trust God, but it's harder. Well, keep trusting God. Well, I don't know. It doesn't look like it's going to come to pass. Well, you ain't dead yet. Keep trusting God. Well, what about Hebrews 11.6? This one, this is more challenging book of Hebrews. And here's the first word. We're just talking about the first word, trust. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it is impossible to please God for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Again, the whole verse is about trust without faith. It's impossible to please God. So trust and faith, faith to me is more of a religious sounding term. So I try to use the word trust. They're, they're both valid terms. But when I want to meet a person who doesn't speak Christianese, I, I don't try to go straight to faith. I'm like, well, what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in your money? Are you trusting in your physical health? Are you trusting in the government? Are you you're trusting in other people that they're going to be there every day of your life in exactly the way you need them? Because those are really bad things to put your ultimate trust in. You've got to trust in God. You've got to put your faith in God because without faith, you can't even please God. But God is deeply pleased with your faith, even if it's weak, even if it's struggling. But you're just saying, I know God is good. I know the plans he's got for me. I know if I don't lean to my own understanding, I will sense victory and breakthrough if I keep trusting the Lord. So that's the first word. Here's the second word of the four words I want to give you today. The second word is, to me, harder than trusting. You know why? Well, the second word is wait. W-A-I-T. Wait. Raise your hand if you're good at waiting. Well, I'm looking in the camera and I didn't see anybody's hand <laughs> raised out there. Most of us aren't good at waiting. I mean, we don't like to wait at the grocery store. We don't like to wait in traffic. We don't like to wait at the coffee shop. We don't like waiting anywhere. We want what we want and we want it now. And sadly, that's gotten into a lot of our Christian uh, lives. You know, we're, we're living our lives and we're forgetting that, man, the best things in life we have to wait for sometimes. And I'll just give you the most famous verse on waiting anywhere in the Bible. You could probably quote it, a lot of you. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Can I read it again? They who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's a promise from the word of God. And it covers the entirety of your life. Like there's a lot of stuff that we just have to wait on and how you wait really affects the climate, the internal atmosphere of your heart. If you're waiting with your anger, your furrowed brow, and you're impatient, you're frustrated, but bless God, I got to wait because I don't have any other choices. I just got to wait on God. That's not the kind of waiting we're talking about. We're talking about a waiting that is connected to the first word, which is trust. So when you're trusting, you can wait. God doesn't operate to my timetables most of the time. Can I just be honest? He knows this about me. I've told, I've talked to the Lord about this in private, so I don't mind telling you. Sometimes I think God moves too slowly. I know some of y'all are like, Jeff, that's blasphemy. No, he knows my heart. I know it's not true. Sometimes I feel like God moves too slowly. Why? Because I'm like you. I'm impatient. But when I wait upon the Lord, guess what happens? I renew my strength. I find out today that God was faithful yesterday while I was waiting. If I have to wait again today, I'm going to learn that he's faithful. If I have to wait again tomorrow, I'm going to find out he's faithful. So I actually gain strength by waiting. You know what it's called when a parent gives their child something or everything that child wants as soon as they want it? What happens to that child? Come on, y'all know. That becomes a spoiled brat. That child is a menace when they get older. Why? Because they expect the whole world to revolve around them. So even us as parents, if we're smart, we know not to give our children or grandchildren everything they want as soon as they want it. Why? Because they need to learn to wait for things and that everything they feel the need for doesn't necessarily mean it's legitimate. And so God's the same kind of parent that we are. He's actually infinitely a better parent. And so when I want something and God's like, Jeff, you're, you're praying like a little child. You're desiring like a little child. You're dreaming like a little child. I'm going to make you wait. And as you wait, you're going to know my heart. You're going to learn my ways. You're going to know that what I've got to offer you is better than that thing you were demanding right then and there. So I'm going to make you wait for it. And when he does that, man, I mount up with wings on, as eagles. Like I, I learn how to soar. I learn how to fly. You do too. Like waiting on God should not leave you bound to the earth. It should actually raise you up on the wings of eagles so you can go to new heights. But you got to get that second word into your vocabulary and into your spirit. So we trust and we wait. And here's the third word. Actually, let me give you a couple more. Yeah, here we go. Let's go to this third word. And this one is one that people just wish wasn't on the list. It's a non-negotiable. I'm going to promise you this. If you don't get this third word down, you will have very little victory in your life. And any victory that you do have, it'll be because you squeezed it out in your own fleshly strength. What is the third word? Obey. <laughs> you didn't see that one coming, did you? Because that's not as inspirational. Trusting, that's inspirational. Waiting, that's like, yeah, we got to do that. Obey is like, uh-oh. Well, Second John 1, 6, the little book of Second John, right before the book of Revelation, says this, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments, this is the commandment. Just as you have heard from the beginning, so should you walk in it. Like Jesus Christ, his life is our, our compelling. It's our invitation. It's how we want to live. His example is the one we're supposed to be following. His words, his teachings, and also the teaching of his apostles. The word of God, the written word of God. That's God's expression of his will for your life and mine. And guys, when we obey it, we're saying to God, you're wise, your plans, your instructions, your ways, your desires, your prohibitions, the thing you call me to say no to, your promises, the things that you call me to trust in you for, uh, all of that is good, Lord. I'm going to obey it to the best of my spirit empowered ability because I want a life that honors you. That's part of what it means to be a victorious Christian. Let me give you another verse. Jesus's own mouth in the book of John, chapter 15, verse 14, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Can you believe that? Jesus said that we're real. We're really his, that we are really close to him. And that is exemplified when we obey him. So the, the opposite needs to be addressed. What do you do with a person that says they're a Christian, they're a Jesus follower, but they don't have any interest in obeying God. Well, one, you try to lead them to the Lord because a perpetually disobedient life is not a Christian life. That's a person that's got a form of godliness, but has never met the Savior. So if a person is consistently enjoying their sin, consistently disregarding the commands of the word of God, 
consistently living in kind of rebellion or disregard for what God says, that's not a Christian. Doesn't matter if they go to church. Doesn't matter if they ask Jesus into their heart. Doesn't matter if they got water baptized. It don't matter if they speak in tongues. That's not a Christian because obedience is the fruit of conversion. And so when we are converted, though, we still struggle at times to obey. But when we learn to obey and trust God and wait on him and just obey, that's when we're getting into a strategic breakthrough kind of pattern of living. And then in Joshua 1, 8, Joshua in chapter 1, God's speaking to him. He says, Joshua, the book of the law, that would have been Joshua's Bible, shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way very prosperous and you will have good success. You catch that? God says, Joshua, I am sending you into the promised land and I want you to obey everything that Moses wrote in the law. Moses is dead, Joshua. You're the new leader. But just as I expected Moses to obey, I'm going to be calling you to obey. And Joshua, let me let you on a little secret. When you obey me, your way gets prosperous. Oh, come on. Some of y'all need to hear that. Like God's not like a slave master trying to get people to obey because he's mean and angry and just wants to get something out of you. That's not God. That's some horribly demonic characterization of God. God is a father and he wants you to walk in obedience because that's the pathway of his blessing. Like God wants to bless you. God wants to lavish you. God wants to prosper you. He wants to anoint you. He wants to use you. He wants to protect you. He wants your life to count for something. He wants you to like literally enjoy the life that he's given you. But he can't do that if you don't obey. For God to bless a disobedient life would be for God to bless our hypocrisy. And then he'd cease to be to be God. So Christian friend, obedience is part of it. Now, I'm giving you four words that are non-negotiables. Trust, wait, obey. These three things have got to be moving in your life daily. Now, very quickly here, I'm realistic. None of us trust perfectly all of our lives. None of us wait perfectly all of our lives. And let's be honest, none of us obey perfectly are our lives. I'm not saying that you have to score 100 out of 100 every single day, but I am saying this, you should want to. You should want to score 100 out of 100 in obedience every day. You should want to score 100 out of 100 in waiting on God every day. And you should want to score 100 out of 100 in trusting God every day. Now, the reality is we stumble, we fail, we fall, we sin. But how do you respond to that? Well, the response of the Christian is to say, Jesus, you died on the cross for my sin. I just did something, said something or thought something that I know was outside of your will. And God, I'm grieved that I have done that. I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. I repent over that sin. I ask you to wash it from me and restore fellowship so I can walk in the pathway of obedience again. You see, God doesn't bless you because of your obedience. He blesses you through your obedience. See, blessing is only only approached through the pathway of obedience. Disobedience leads you away from God's blessing. It'll never lead you to God's blessing. D hear me on this. Disobedience will never lead you to God's blessing. That's why God wants you to obey. It's not about rule keeping as much as it is honoring the father, trusting what he says, believing his ways are better than your ways and saying, I'm going to do it your way, God. And God says, I'm glad for you, because when you do it my way, you will land in the place of blessing. So are there areas in your life that you're not obeying right now? Hey, look, I mean, it could be a hundred different areas. One of the places that I found God's blessing to land on me is when I am faithful, trusting and waiting on him in my finances. I just want to speak to this real quickly. No, I'm not taking up an offering. I'm just trying to help you right here. If you're constantly broke, if you've never been able to have anything in life, I'm going to ask you a question. You can't answer me, but I want you to think about the answer. Are you faithful with your finances? Even if you're, if, if you're poor, remember the widow in Jesus' example, the woman gave what little she had, but she gave it under the uh, temple offering. And, and, and Jesus said, that lady's given more than anybody. She could have said, well, I'm so poor. I've got to keep this. And she didn't. She gave what she had. And Jesus put her down in scripture forever to be remembered. 
So if you need financial breakthrough, but you're unfaithful in your finances, well, God can't bless your finances if you're not tithing, if you're not giving. He just can't. Now, you can you can work to earn as much money as you want, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about is God blessing your finances? Um, there are so many other areas. We want God's blessing on our families. We want God's blessing on our church. We want God's blessing on our bodies. We want God's blessing in our ministries. But the question is, are we obeying? Because if I want his blessing on my family, I've got to know what my role is and I've got to do it under obedience. I, if I want his blessing on my children, I've got to learn how to be the dad that I'm supposed to be. If I want his blessing on my ministry, then I can't do it in the energy of my flesh. I've got to pray. I've got to fast. I've got to stay in the word of God. And if I ask God to bless what I'm doing in my family, my finances or my ministry, but I'm not obeying him, this is what I'm actually praying. God, please me, make me the exception to the way you do things. I know you won't bless others who are disobedient, but I'm expecting you to bless my disobedience. And friends, that's never going to work for anybody. Now, again, I'm giving you four words today in this episode that I believe are absolutely essential words for your victory. Now, if you don't want to live in spiritual victory, well, do it your own way, but you'll never be satisfied. You'll never, ever feel the pleasure of the Lord on your life. You'll go around striving and it'll always depend on you. And you'll never know if, if you're acting in a way that protects you. And instead of just obeying and trusting and waiting on the Lord, you end up having to be your own little God, taking care of yourself, making sure you've got all your bases covered and you've got to provide for yourself and you've got to protect yourself and you've got to promote yourself and all this self-talk. That's what happens when people don't trust in the Lord, when they don't wait on the Lord, when they don't obey God. Now, that's three of the four words. And so for the remaining time, I want to talk to you about this fourth one. And I think, yeah, it's probably the most important one. Because if you trust, but don't do what I'm about to tell you about, you don't win. If you wait, but don't do what I'm about to tell you about, then you don't win. And if you obey, but fail to do what I'm about to tell you about, uh, you don't win. So what is this fourth word? Well, it's the word endure. Endure. What does endure mean? I'm going to put it in the most simple terms that you'd have to hire a bunch of professionals to confuse you. What does the word mean? It means you keep going. That's right. You keep pressing on. You keep battling through. You never, ever, 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 ever quit. You don't give up. You don't throw your hands up. You don't walk away. You don't throw in the towel. You don't choose not to show up for one more day of fighting the good fight. You endure until the end. Now, let me read you some verses. The book of the Hebrews in chapter number 10. Let me read you verse 35 and verse 36. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. They'll be up on your screen. The writer says this. Do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Now, I'm going to slow down right here. This is incredibly important for you to get. Don't throw away your confidence. What could he be talking about? Everything you've learned and believed and experienced up to this point. Don't throw it all away. Don't quit. Don't let all of that end up being for nothing because in a difficult season, you choose not to endure. He says, you have need of endurance. He was writing to people that were suffering for being Christians in the first century. Some of their family members have been killed. Some of the very people he was writing in the book of Hebrews, they had lost their wealth, lost their businesses, lost their social connections because they had dared to become Christians, which was very unpopular at that time. He says, you've got to endure. You have this great need of endurance on your life. Hey, hear me on this. Some of you are very gifted. You have spiritual gifts and natural abilities that God has given you. Maybe you're a good speaker. Maybe you're a good singer. Maybe you're good with money. Maybe you're good at spiritual gifts. Maybe you prophesy. Maybe you pray in tongues. Maybe you lay your hands on the sick. Oh, that's awesome. Nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But you know what? If you don't endure, none of that stuff matters. Because your commitment level, your journey of faith is like a little vapor. It appeared for a little while and then it disappeared. So the writer of Hebrews says, these are crucial seasons in our lives when just as we're ready to quit, we have need that we might endure. 
Can I speak prophetically to some of you right now? I don't know who's watching right now, but I'm feeling this like by the Holy Spirit right now. Some of you are on the verge of giving up. You just can't do it anymore. You can't put up with that person in your life anymore. You can't keep having anxiety and worrying. You've served God. You've tried your best, but it didn't give you the breakthrough in the time that you wanted. Or maybe you've gone through a long season of drought spiritually after years of plentifulness. And you're like, has God left me? Is this it? Is this what I worked for and served for? And the devil's getting in there and accusing God to you that God gave up on you and God abandoned you and God walked away from you and God let disaster hit you and you're ready to quit. I say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for his glory, you will not quit. You will not quit. You're not made to die in a valley. You're not made to die on the battlefield. You're made to overcome and step into victory. And I say to you, you must endure, just like the writer of Hebrews said, so that you can receive Hebrews 10, 36, so that you can receive what has been promised you. I know it gets hard, but that's why we have this last verse. And then I'm going to be done. Galatians 6, 9, you know this verse. Let us not grow weary of doing good. Remember the King James, be not weary, be not weary in well-doing. Let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. If we do not give up, you're going to have the harvest. You see, that's the way it works. You work the ground in harvest. When it comes to a fruitful season, you have to work the ground. That's no fun. You have to plant the seed. That's no fun. You have to tend to the seed as it becomes shoots and then crops eventually. That's hard, hard work. But you know where the fun comes? When you reap, when you harvest, when you bring in all that you labored for, all that you endured for, all that you trusted God for, all that you waited upon the Lord for. It's the reaping season that you get to enter into. But it's only if you don't quit. So my friend, don't be weary in doing the right thing. Don't be weary in trusting God. Don't be weary in waiting upon the Lord. Don't be weary with obeying God day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. Is it hard sometimes? Yeah, it is hard because your world, your flesh, and that devil, they fight you. But what are the alternatives? To give in to the world? To give in to your flesh? To obey the devil? No. You've got to endure. You've got to move forward. You've got to press in. And you can do it. I know some of you are tired. I know for some of you this is a heaven sent message. And I can't snap my fingers and make it all better for you overnight. But I can tell you this. These four words have worked in my life for nearly 30 years of following Jesus and my mind's made up. So I'm praying for you today as I close that you'll endure. I'm praying that you'll continue to obey. I'm praying that you'll grow in waiting. And I pray that you will trust the Lord for the remainder of your days. We'll see you.